Seed starting supplies are like Pokemon. You got to catch them all. Well, it feels like that some days. The truth is there are essentials, things you absolutely need, things you absolutely should not cheap out on. And then there's kind of those premium options, the things that you can spend money on if you have a little bit of extra cash or things you may want to treat yourself to if you've been grinding for years and you just want to be a little bit more effective. So today's video, we're going to go through the real foundation of seed starting. Water, sunlight, heat, airflow, seeds. And we're going to look at the essential item that you need based in science, whether you should cheap out or not, and then the premium add-on or the premium choice you could make if you have a little bit of that extra cash or looking to upgrade because you've been doing this for years. So I hope this helps out the beginners. I also hope it helps out the geek crew who have been doing this for like 20, 25 years because there's a lot of people at the geek crew that have been doing this for a long time, um, but they just enjoy the content. And with that being said, if you like science-based information, hi, hello, my name is Ashley and I have a bachelor's of science in soil science. I like to take that science and apply it to plants um, and soil in a very digestible manner, I've been told. And if you like the sounds of that, I encourage you to hit that subscribe button turn on that notification bell and you will be updated every time I do a science-based video. And always remember to drop your video ideas down below in the comments because I use those comments to make my YouTube videos because I'm not that creative, unfortunately. Okay, so I think number one goes without saying, potting soil. So what we're looking for when we're looking for a seed starting mix is a finer fiber, something that is low in nutrients to avoid things like that white fuzz we see on top, dampening off, all of which is caused by a seed starting mix that has a little bit too much compost, manures, vermicast in it. We want it to be relatively inert. Now, this is one that I don't think you should go for the potting soil and you should go for the seed starting mix. It will make a big difference. The exception to that rule would be if you're doing something a larger sized seed. For example, a runner bean, maybe a zucchini, peas, beans, that sort of thing. If we're talking smaller plants, um, for example, your tomatoes, your peppers, all of your flowers, except for maybe a castor bean plant, we want that finer potting soil. Think of a potting soil as basically tucking in a toddler using three giant pillows. It's way too heavy and there's not enough air. So to avoid just snuffing them out, very morbid. I don't know. It's a Sunday night, very late Sunday. I've been Christmas baking all day. <laughs> I'm tired. Anyways, yeah, so that just, just spend the money on. My favorite is the Jiffy, the yellow Jiffy bag. I highly recommend you do not go for the Miracle Grow one. It is absolutely horrible. Jiffy pods work, that sort of thing. I'm going to do a video just on seed starting mixes and kind of going through what your different options are and when to use them and that sort of thing. So stay tuned for that. That uh, will be coming out in the new year. The premium version of a seed starting mix, you actually may want to go for a sifter. So not only are you going to buy a seed starting mix, you're going to buy a fine sifter. Then you're going to use said fine sifter and you're going to sift out the fibers that are larger in size. And yes, it can make a big difference and it may be something worth your time. Not to mention that citra can then also be used in the spring when you're rehabbing some of your older soil. Okay, so next up is trays and cells. So if you're a beginner, what you want is you want one bottom tray that has no holes in it and you want that to be very, very sturdy. Now, it doesn't have to be, of course, it's like nothing in the house. It doesn't have to be uh, a seed starting tray. It just has to be, it could be a cookie sheet. I've used cookie sheets in the past. I've used like the baking tins. Like it doesn't have to be crazy, but you want it hard. This is the Vigo one. I would consider this premium. It's not cheap, but it also doesn't bend. The reason for that is because once you get any sort of size on your plants, water, soil, et cetera, and so forth, this becomes heavy and this folds and snaps and breaks and it's heartbreak. So in order to avoid that, get something that is nice and firm, no holes. This one's pretty shallow. You could get something with more of an edge on it. That's totally up to you. Number two is actually getting 
your seed cells. So the seed cells you want to go with are going to be smaller. You want to go for like the 72 cells. You could go for the 50 if you wanted to. Anything below that actually wouldn't recommend it for a beginner to do seed starting in. The reason for that being is the smaller cells have a higher or faster water utilization capability. So this means that the roots won't be exposed to hypoxia, so they're not going to rot because they don't get enough oxygen. It's also going to allow that cell to heat up faster, which in turn allows for the seed to germinate faster. And it also is less surface area for things like the mold and the fuzz to develop. So go for those smaller cells. It seems odd that you'd need something you know, that tiny to grow what will one day be an eight-foot tail plant. But trust me, that is all you want to go with. For all my premium folks out there, you actually may choose to go for a mesh bottom. So rather than this really rigid structure, you may have a tray bottom that has holes in it. And it's, I guess you're not, it's not so much holes. It's like slits. So what you can do is you can get a tray, like your regular tray, and then you can get the slip bottom tray, kind of put that on, and then you get a soil blocker, and you're going to block your soil in. I have videos on that. And that, in turn, allows you to lift the soil blocking tray up, allowing it to drain out. So if you do overfill or overwater, you're noticing something odd, you can pull kind of that slotted tray up. I see a lot of people who do soil blocking directly into like trays like this, which is not ideal because you could run into issues. It doesn't happen all the time, but it can happen sometimes. And then you're going to be cursing yourself, wishing you had the slotted tray. But yeah, those are an option. Something to think about if you're going for premium. I'm going to say this, and it's maybe controversial, but premium does not always mean easier. Just a heads up. So soil blocking, I don't know. It depends on the year for me. Depends on the year. Okay, so next up is lighting. So if you're a beginner, what you want to do is get a full spectrum light. Any of them. It doesn't matter. There are fancy LED ones. There are tube ones. There are bulbs. It does not matter. All you want is to get a full spectrum light. From there, you are going to assess what the plant is doing to determine if that light needs to be lowered or lifted or if you need more light in some cases. So if the plant is stunted and short and looks kind of burnt um, and sick, then you want to lift that light up. If the plant is looking leggy and ridiculous, then you want to lower that light down. You don't need a dimmer. You don't need a timer. Um, If you leave the lights on 24 hours, oddly enough, it doesn't cause that much of an issue. I'm going to do some trials with that this year. But it's not like a huge make it or break it by any means. So you don't need a timer. Just make sure they get somewhere around 10 hours of light and drop to the ratios. Nothing fancy. Do not get the LED like block things because those you will have the plants on the ground. You'll have that light four feet above them. You'll still be frying your plants because they're way, way, way too strong for seedlings in my humble opinion. If you are an experienced grower, it is time for you to look at the PPFD charts of your lights. I have a whole video on that. If I forget to link it down below, let me know and I will do that. But that's something that is important to look at. You really want to up your game in this world. You want a plant that a light that dims ideally is full spectrum. In some cases, you may choose to go for lights that have very specific spectrums depending on what your goals are flowering, vegetative growth, et cetera, and so forth. Lights can get complicated. Lights can get expensive. It's not where I would choose to put my premium cash money, but some people do. And that is probably people that are growing indoors. I would say people who have like an indoor garden are the ones that are going to be doing that. And that makes sense in that case. Seed starting, I don't know. To me, it doesn't, it's not like a huge make it or break it. Next up is heat. So If you've been on this channel long enough, you know that every seed actually has a temperature in which it germinates. So it has a range. Some of these can be cooler, 5 degrees, 10 degrees, soil temp. Others need to be like 20, 25 degrees Celsius, which is a little bit warmer, and that's where the heat map kicks in. 
If you're a beginner gardener and it's not something you're sure you want to do forever or you're really testing the waters or you're on a tight budget, you can skip this. I think you can skip this for your tomatoes. You can skip it for your peppers. The only thing you want to look at and to consider is that it's going to take a little bit more time for those to germinate. So you may want to just start them a little bit sooner. And by a little bit, I mean like two to three weeks max. Um, even then, you probably could start at the same time and be okay. You may be limited in what flowers you can start. That's pretty normal because some of the flowers, like the petunias and stuff, they do require some heat. Now, if you're dead set on this happening and you want to do really hot peppers or things that do need heat, you've got registers, you've got warm, sunny windows, you got the top of your refrigerators, you name it. Find a hot spot, put it on there. Temperature is probably not going to be exactly what you want it to be. So those aren't going to have a thermostat. They'll do it a pinch for sure. Real good hack is actually incandescent lighting. So if you have some of those old school lights that throw off a little bit of heat, don't melt the plastic on your domes by any stretch of the imagination. But that can help as well. So definitely something you could skip if you chose to. For those of you looking for the premium experience, you want to get the heat mount with the thermostat. And then you want to get the soil temp probe. And you want to probe the soil and actually figure out what the soil temp is and then adjust that mount, despite popular belief the thermostat is not always right, depending on the size of your cell. So if you have a smaller cell, you probably go with the thermostat and they're probably going to be pretty dead on. If you have a bigger cell, for example, something like this, then your thermostat's probably not going to be that accurate. A soil probe, temp probe, however, would be. You may want to figure out a chart of all the different temperatures you need to aim for, et cetera, and so forth. Again, you can get very high tech with this. And someone actually, interestingly enough, when I did a Christmas, Gardener's Christmas gift video, they said they get the heat mat for the plants, and then it actually doubles for the rest of the year as a foot warmer underneath their desk, which is pure genius. You know you're part of the geek crew when you cook shit up like that. Like that human being, you are awesome. You are my bestie. You are my spirit animal because that is gold right there. Multi-purpose. If you really wanted to go crazy, you could actually get an insulated bottom. So rather than just using like your typical plant racking, you may choose to make a kind of a bed of sand is quite often popular version of this just to help insulate some of that heat and make it evenly dispersed etc and so forth so that's another thing to think about okay next up is humidity control so this one for my beginners is a must you need these domes they're so important for that germination you only need them until the seeds germinate once the seeds have germinated you can pop them off no problem they don't have to be sophisticated they don't have to be tough they literally just need to be a plastic, a flimsy plastic at that. It doesn't have to have vents. It doesn't have to be special. It literally just has to be a dome of plastic. You uh, can make it out of cellophane if you really wanted to or what a uh, cling wrap. You may want to upgrade to something with some height. Insert this one right here. This is Vigo. Again, this is tall. This is rigid. This is got insulation on top. And the Ella's feathers are all over it. You can tell she's molting for the winter. Anyways, this you can put on top and leave on top. I don't know. To me, it doesn't make that much of a benefit to leave uh, domes on top long term, personally. But some people do it, and I like it. So something you could definitely give a shot. What? This top is weird. Like, is there a purpose to this being recessed? Probably not. Don't think too much, Ashley. Don't think too much. Don't think too much. Brain needs to shut off some days. Okay, next up is watering. So, my newbies, you want a bottom tray that allows for bottom watering. That's kind of that firmer tray, no holes that we spoke about. Number two, my preference would be until things germinate for sure to avoid kind of that fungal growth on top is a mister. So, this mister does not need to be sophisticated. It could be a dropper in some cases. So to put it into perspective, my grandma growing up used to take a ketchup bottle. You could use a Gatorade bottle. And she poked like five or six holes on the top of the lid. And she would just sprinkle the plants. And the idea here is to ensure the plant gets enough water to germinate without suffocating those roots, causing hypoxia. And also trying to avoid that, that fungal growth that can take place. So. 
That is from a newbies. For my people who are looking to spend money, capillary mounts, I think is probably my suggestion for you. They're a game changer. You literally can set it and forget it. If you're doing traveling March, April, February, March, April, and you don't want to get someone in to water your seedlings, and you don't want to be behind on seed starting, capillary mat, you literally fill up a five-gallon pail bucket, you know, drop the capillary mat tail in there, and it does its thing. It's really, really handy stuff. Reusable as well. So. Next up is Airflow. So Airflow is a fan. The fans do not need to be sophisticated. It just needs to be a fan, quite literally. A fan. Ideally an oscillating fan, but if you don't have that, just a fan in general. You only have one fan and you got a whole, like, a rack. Just kind of move it every day. Move the fan up and down. Just to allow for some of that airflow. Premium version of this? There isn't one. I guess get a Dyson? Don't know. I don't know what the premium version of airflow would be. Something really crazy, I'm sure, is out there. Let me know in the comments below if you know what that is. So there you have it. That is your guide to success. You do not have to go all out or you may choose to go all out. Kind of up to you. Don't get fooled into thinking you have to have all these really fancy seed starting cells and blockers and soil and fertilizers and all that. If you get what I just told you to get, nothing more. Then you watch this channel throughout the entire seed starting season into the summer. I can guarantee you success. There's a lot of key crew members who did that last year with me, and they're very happy campers, to say the least. There you guys have it. I will talk to you guys next time. Bye.